Buongiorno e benvenuti, sono Anna Masera e sarò la moderatrice di questo evento del Master in Giornalismo di Torino. Margaret Sullivan, che saluto, pazienterà nella prima parte in italiano per il suo dialogo con noi, che eh, poi sarà ovviamente in inglese. E saluto anche il, tutto il pubblico connesso via Facebook. Hi to the English speaking public connected on Facebook and hi Margaret, please bear with us for the introduction, introductions in Italian. We'll soon switch to English. Allora saluto e eh, grazie per essere con noi Marco Castelnuovo che dirige il Corriere di Torino e sono venuti a salutare gli studenti, il direttore Stefano Geuna che saluto e ringrazio, il direttore scientifico del Master Christopher Cefeni, cioè il presidente dell'ordine del Piemonte Alberto Sinigaglia che ringrazio per, essere, per averci raggiunto e passerei subito a loro la parola. E, prego rettore. Grazie, grazie, buonasera a tutte e a tutti. È un piacere essere qui presente oggi a salutare, un saluto a tutti, in primis ovviamente gli studenti e le studentesse del nostro master e in particolare la dottoressa Margaret Sullivan che terrà la sua lezione magistrale eh, qui eh, a nostro uso, ma sfruttando anche potenzialità di, web, di tutti coloro che vorranno collegarsi via Facebook attraverso il video. Scusate. Il tema, il tema della, della lecture della dottoressa Sullivan mi, mi interessa molto e mi dà uh, lo spunto per, per alcune brevissime considerazioni iniziali, eh, si parla di, di, di giornalismo locale, si parla di informazione locale, si parla ovviamente in generale di giornalismo e informazione e, e da medico lasciatemi anche eh, pensare a, a quello che è stato l'argomento la, di maggiore attenzione dell'informazione e del giornalismo negli ultimi mesi purtroppo perché si è trattato di un dramma, di una tragedia che ha colpito l'intera umanità ovvero la grande pandemia, la Covid-19, per fortuna la quale cominciamo a vedere in qualche misura la fine, ma che tanti danni ha fatto in questi ultimi mesi. E, e qui veramente si, è si sono scoperte tante cose, una, due su tutte vorrei metterle sullo stesso piano. Da un lato l'importanza della scienza perché si è scoperto quanto valgano le informazioni, le informazioni vere, le informazioni basate sulle evidenze, quindi le cosiddette informazioni scientifiche, pur con tutte le loro eh, limitazioni, sono le uniche che, che ci permettono di affrontare le situazioni della vita, in particolare quelle più complesse, avendo una speranza di raggiungerle. Ma di fianco alle, alle informazioni vere, alla scienza, ci ha fatto rivalutare anche la modalità di comunicare modalità di e quindi il giornalismo e quindi l'informazione e in particolare l'abbiamo scoperto tutti l'informazione locale l'informazione nella propria città nel proprio quartiere addirittura abbiamo tutti seguito credo con molta più attenzione i vari servizi delle varie testate a partire dal dal nostro TG regionale della RAI, ma che sicuramente ha svolto un'attività capillare in questi mesi, ma qui lasciatemi ricordare, non solo perché sia parte della nostra comunità accademica, anche la, la testata Futura News del, del Master di Giornalismo del nostro Ateneo, che ha avuto picchi di ascolto molto alti e ha cercato di fornire, come tante altre espressioni dell'informazione locale, di trasmettere, da un lato far conoscere eh, che cosa succedeva intorno a noi e dall'altro anche trasmettere eh, il, la, le informazioni che provenivano dal mondo degli scienziati, dal mondo della scienza, eh, per affrontare al meglio le sfide che, ci hanno, che abbiamo dovuto affrontare in queste ultime settimane. Quindi noi come università sicuramente ce la mettiamo tutta per produrre scienza e per produrre anche cultura della scienza, cultura dell'informazione e in particolare nel Master di Giornalismo cultura della, della trasmissione dell'informazione, cultura del giornalismo appunto di alto livello basato sulle evidenze, basato su un'etica importante che purtroppo spesso oggi con l'informazione libera 
sulla rete, che sicuramente ha dei grandi vantaggi, ma ci porta anche dei grandi rischi, viene meno, e viene meno soprattutto nei momenti, e ce ne accorgiamo nei momenti di maggiore difficoltà. Quindi ringrazio, ringrazio ancora gli animatori, le varie anime del, master, del nostro master di giornalismo, in generale per il loro lavoro, per aver organizzato questo evento, che pur parlando di giornalismo locale ci pone a livello internazionale, visto il livello e la caratura internazionale della nostra graditissima ospite. E un saluto, lasciatemelo per ultimo, alle studentesse e agli studenti del nostro master che si accingono a terminare il loro percorso, ma anche agli studenti che ancora sono eh, in via di completamento e a quelli che in futuro, sempre più numerosi e sempre più appassionati, continueranno a, eh, a credere nel mestiere del giornalismo con tutti i rischi anche che questo comporta perché già è difficile sapere tutti i mestieri come saranno domani quello del giornalista è uno di quelli che cambia più in fretta per, per ovvi motivi e quindi credere ancora nella sfida di, di fare questo bellissimo mestiere è un segno di bello anche vedere che i giovani ancora ci credono e credo che eh, che diceva all'inizio, insomma, l'importanza che ha ripreso, ri, rievocato in queste ultime settimane di informazione, di qualità, sia un, un viatico e sicuramente un messaggio di ottimismo per tutte le giovani colleghe e colleghi che eh, in questi giorni si, si portano sempre di più a affrontare questo. Buon lavoro e grazie. Grazie. Grazie, Rettore. Io eh, grazie per il saluto anche perché abbiamo avuto varie occasioni per incontrarci da quando è stato insediato il Rettore, quindi mi fa piacere che sia venuto a salutarci alla fine del percorso. Eh, darei la parola subito a, a Alberto Sinigaglia, Presidente dell'Ordine del Piemonte. Grazie Alberto per essere venuto a salutarci. Grazie a te, grazie a tutti che saluto calorosamente. E anch'io mi ricollego a quanto diceva il professor Geuna eh, al, alla vicenda del, del virus. Nelle prime settimane dell'emergenza eh, la gente è tornata ai giornali, è tornata in edicola, si è attaccata ai telegiornali della sera come da tanti anni non succedeva, si è attaccata ai giornali radio, all'informazione in rete quando era garantita da testate giornalistiche cioè c'è stato il bisogno di mettersi in mani sicure con l'attenuarsi della pandemia invece siamo tornati a vendite a vedere diminuire le vendite in edicola eh, a diminuire l'audience televisiva radiofonica e sul web più del ridursi dei numeri preoccupa però il declino della qualità del giornalismo il pericolo maggiore delle democrazie è l'illusione di essere informati la confusione tra informazione e comunicazione. In questa confusione sguazzano populisti e sovranisti, secondo i quali il giornalismo è finito e quello che non è ancora finito va scoraggiato perché intermediario fastidioso tra la politica e il popolo. Questo dimostra che non c'è mai stato tanto bisogno di giornalismo che persegua la missione di cercare la verità di fornirla ai cittadini che hanno diritto di sapere, di conoscere per capire, per ragionare, per scegliere. Il giornalismo come primo difensore contro le fake news. Per combattere il declino del mercato dobbiamo combattere il declino della nostra qualità, che è spesso declino di competenza, di capacità e possibilità di verifica, anche purtroppo di conoscenza linguistica. Su questo fronte da anni l'Ordine dei giornalisti collabora con l'Università di Torino per il Master e oltre il Master anche per la formazione e l'aggiornamento professionale. E abbiamo il progetto di migliorarlo ancora. Buon lavoro dunque per oggi e per il futuro e visto che è presente eh, il Rettore, eh, voglio ricordare, eh, come abbiamo già fatto con lui, un giornalista di cui quest'anno è uno dei giornalisti dei quali Quest'anno cade il centenario della nascita, come Giorgio Bocca, Enzo Biaggi, Carlo Laurenzi. Il nome che voglio fare è quello di Gigi Ghirotti. A proposito di giornalismo ben fatto, 
a proposito di passione per il mestiere, a proposito di una certa idea dell'Italia e della sua società. Gigi Ghirotti, eh, lo ricordo eh, ai, ai ragazzi e a coloro che ci ascoltano, è un, era un inviato speciale della stampa, poi dell'europeo, poi ancora della stampa, il quale eh, seppe di essere malato di cancro e appena l'ebbe saputo, uscito dallo studio medico, entrò nella redazione romana della stampa e propose di fare un'inchiesta sugli ospedali, sugli ospedali pubblici, di farsi inviato malato tra i malati. Ne nacque un, in, una corsia d'ospedale pubblico, ne nacque un'inchiesta famosa, un'inchiesta importante che ha cambiato il volto della medicina, che ha reso più umana quella medicina, eh, eh, l'inchiesta eh, aveva il titolo e poi eh, sarebbe uscito anche il, un libro dallo stesso titolo eh, Lungo viaggio nel tunnel della malattia e mi sembra giusto eh, ricordarlo eh, in quest'anno in quest'anno non solo per il centenario ma anche per la coincidenza tragica della pandemia che stiamo ancora vivendo e mi sembra giusto ricordarvelo oggi proprio facendo seguito alle parole del Rettore e dicendo questo è un magnifico mestiere però attenzione è un mestiere di grande responsabilità una responsabilità la nostra non differente da quella di un medico possiamo fare delle cose importanti ma dobbiamo farlo bene essere preparati e assumerci le nostre responsabilità gravi responsabilità hanno anche gli editori delle testate ma non dimentichiamo le nostre e cominciamo col, con lo sfogliare dei libri o, o dei computer, perché la preparazione è la prima cosa e sottolineo ancora, eh, lo dico soprattutto ai ragazzi, l'importanza della conoscenza della lingua. Abbiamo bisogno di conoscere più parole e di conoscerne profondamente il significato. Buon lavoro a tutti per oggi e per il futuro. Grazie Alberto Sinigaglia, grazie mille e spero che tu possa restare e anche se devi dare il posto fisicamente al nostro direttore scientifico Christopher Cepenic, a cui passo subito la parola. Grazie Anna, grazie, grazie a tutti voi che ci state ascoltando, grazie a Margaret Sullivan per essere qui con noi oggi e per darci questa importante occasione di confronto. Allora io eh, sarò molto breve ma certamente eh, io la ringrazio anche per aver scelto con noi e per aver condiviso con noi il tema che lei disputerà con noi, cioè da un lato la questione del giornalismo locale che è stato richiamato ed è oggettivamente un tema di grande interesse ma poi c'è l'aspetto che eh, eh, per quanto mi riguarda insomma per quanto riguarda anche i miei interessi di ricerca l'impatto che il giornalismo e soprattutto il giornalismo locale ha sulla democrazia americana questo non è soltanto ovviamente un tema che riguardi la democrazia americana tutte le nostre democrazie avanzate stanno eh, eh, in questo momento eh, dovendo fare i conti eh, stanno facendo in qualche modo i conti non soltanto con l'indebolimento del sistema dell'informazione del, del, dell ma anche con un enorme empowerment della comunicazione politica. Allora lo scenario che probabilmente Margaret Sullivan traccerà circa le, stiamo guardando eh, ciò che accadrà negli Stati Uniti anche perché ci sono le elezioni presidenziali non ce lo nascondiamo, cioè questo elemento probabilmente è un elemento di scenario importante per dire anche il posizionamento dei giornali locali, dei media, dei media tradizionali e come abbiamo visto anche ormai, visto l'atteggiamento di Twitter, no? delle grandi piattaforme social rispetto alle dinamiche eh, informative. Quindi un tema eh, che mh, non vedo l'ora di, 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 di affrontare adesso con Margaret Sullivan e sono certo che avremo di qui in avanti fino a novembre almeno la possibilità di incontrarci e di discutere ancora eh, questo tema più avanti. Eh, da direttore scientifico del Master un'ultima nota la faccio perché tutti hanno fatto riferimento a quanto l'epidemia di Covid-19 abbia cambiato le, 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 un po' le nostre abitudini, un po' le nostre professioni. Allora i ragazzi e le ragazze che ci stanno ascoltando sanno bene quanto questa epidemia abbia cambiato il nostro, eh, eh, il nostro Master sia sul piano del, della didattica, sia sul piano dell'organizzazione redazionale. 
A me piace ricordare da una parte il grande sforzo che è stato fatto per poter assicurare il massimo della capacità di impegno, di studio da parte nostra, ma soprattutto il grande lavoro e il grande sforzo che hanno fatto le ragazze e i ragazzi del Basta. Io credo che eh, ricorderò per sempre i loro TG da casa. Io, spero, io mh, ho guardato con grande eh, interesse e con grande passione la modalità con cui sono riusciti, nonostante uno scenario oggettivamente difficile, eh, sono riusciti, riuscite a fare un TG di grande qualità dalle proprie abitazioni, dalle proprie cucine, dalle proprie stanze da letto. Allora questo è per me un elemento che mi fa riflettere su un fatto. E cioè che se è vero che questa crisi ci ha tolto qualcosa dal punto di vista relazionale, purtroppo ci siamo visti poco nell'ultima parte di questo eh, biennio, ci siamo relazionati poco, abbiamo fatto poche cose insieme e guardandoci negli occhi eh, abbiamo eh, utilizzato meno modalità di tipo tradizionale e questo è vero e secondo me lì abbiamo perso qualcosa. Però è anche vero che abbiamo scoperto con questa modalità il vero atteggiamento che deve avere un giornalista. Cioè quello che io ho visto uscire, che si è molto potenziato nei ragazzi e nelle ragazze che ci stanno ascoltando, con questa modalità la spinta e la vocazione ad essere giornalisti tanto più forti di prima. Per questo io ringrazio, nonostante tutto, il team del, eh, del Master in Giornalismo, i nostri tutor, eh, Sabrina Roglio, eh, eh, Valentina, tutti quanti, ma il mio pensiero è per i ragazzi soprattutto, perché hanno dato una dimostrazione di professionalità che francamente mi ha lasciato molto soddisfatto. Buona lezione e buona continuazione a tutti. Oh, mettetevela via il vostro direttore scientifico che vi ha fatto i complimenti eh, Christopher è vero è, stato, è stata una dura prova questa di stare sempre da, da remoto ed è, 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 voi sapete quanto mi sanguini il cuore per non avervi potuti vedere però insomma so che prossimamente ci, ci rivedremo comunque anche al di fuori del master quindi sapete che le porte qua sono sempre aperte darei la parola adesso a all'amico Marco Castelnuovo che è ehm, direttore della edizione di Tonino del Corriere della Sera e che ringrazio per essere venuto perché i ragazzi li conosce già dall'anno scorso e un saluto alla fine dell'anno è bellissimo averlo da te. E speriamo poi che possa venire anche il mio direttore Massimo Giannini più tardi forse ci raggiungerà ma temo che abbia avuto un contrattempo e non sia in grado di raggiungerci ma vedremo. Prego Marco. Eh, ciao a tutti, grazie Anna per l'invito, grazie a tutti quelli che mi hanno preceduto e che mi sta ascoltando. Eh, sarò brevissimo, visto che sia il Rettore che il Presidente Senigalli e anche Ceperni ci hanno di fatto detto quello che si doveva dire, no? Eh, questa, mh, e non voglio togliere spazio a Margaret Sullivan, di cui tutti siamo impazienti di, di, di ascoltare. Eh, è chiaro, sì, questa pandemia è... è non si può non farne riferimento, nel senso che la pandemia ha cambiato il mondo e lo cambierà e cambierà anche il mondo del giornalismo, me ne sono accorto facendo il giornale e, e mi rendo conto di quello che sarà e quello che succederà poi, quindi è evidente che la pandemia ha cambiato tutto e questo per voi che uscite da un master è un grande vantaggio, poi cercherò di spiegarvi come. E, siete molto fortunati di aver finito il master adesso, perché avete, cioè una, non dico una tavola rasa, però certo c'è una strada che va ri, ri, ridisegnata, no? Si vede, se vogliamo, la terra, ma siamo in barca, quindi eh, la strada non è segnata e uno può decidere dove andare. Questo, se vogliamo, è, è bellissimo. E perché dico così? Perché, ehm, come ha detto prima anche il Rettore, come ha detto anche prima il Presidente Sinigalia, il riferimento al giornalismo di qualità verificato, insomma c'è stato un grosso ritorno ai grandi brand che fanno giornalismo, lo fanno in modo professionale e il giornalismo scientifico, il Corriere della Sera si è avvantaggiato rispetto a tutti gli altri perché aveva una redazione salute, perché faceva un settimanale sulla salute e quindi conosceva virologi, epidemiologi e medici eh, aveva intratura negli ospedali e quindi è stata molto avvantaggiata ma quanti di noi hanno Uh, affrontato uh, con rigore scientifico o un argomento scientifico sui giornali. Prima della pandemia c'era comunque la crisi climatica che se vogliamo sovrasta 
il coronavirus per portata e per, e, e per anni non c'è nessuna, non c'è una redazione clima nelle redazioni, adesso scusatemi la banalizzazione, e questa è una cosa alla quale uno in realtà se vuole fare un giornale moderno dovrebbe pensare, se un tempo ci si occupava di esteri, cronache, cultura, spettacoli, oggi si dovrebbe occupare di medicina, salute e benessere, eh, crisi climatica, emergenza lavoro, insomma sono cambiati i propri temi. E qui un giovane, secondo me, si deve infilare. Eh, come diceva, e già chiudo, eh, prima il vostro direttore scientifico e anche Anna, eh, il fatto di non essersi visto è un controsenso. Il giornalismo è sempre di più un lavoro di squadra, è sempre più un lavoro dove uno mette una firma, l'altro mette eh, la statistica, l'altro mette la visualizzazione dei dati, è un lavoro di team. Uno scrive da Pechino, l'altro scrive da New York. Bisogna vedersi e soprattutto bisogna vedere, bisogna andare, vedere, capire, parlare, eh, cal calpestare il marciapiede, come si, dico, come si diceva un tempo. Questa è una parte che a tutti è mancata in questa, in questa fase. Però è anche vero, e questo è sull'input, però è anche vero che sull'output tutto è cambiato. Cioè, quelli che dicono, quando io chiedo alle persone perché vuoi fare il giornalista, e mi dicono perché mi piace scrivere, io rispondo sempre a loro, che è come se uno mi dicesse io voglio andare a giocare nell'Inter e io gli chiedessi ma perché vuoi giocare nell'Inter? E quello mi risponde perché mi piace correre. E il correre come lo scrivere sono me delle precondizioni se uno vuole fare il giornalista o vuole giocare nell'Inter. Quello che deve fare adesso un giornalista è trovare non solo i modi per recepire un'informazione ma anche quella di comunicarla. Che non è più solo l'articolo scritto e addirittura non è neanche più solo un video perché può essere un video con le scritte, un video in verticale. Pensate che non ci sono nemmeno i player sul web per fare i, i video in verticali. Stanno nascendo ora perché Instagram ha, ha introdotto questa nuova forma di comunicazione. I video in un minuto, i podcast, le notifiche, l'informazione su Instagram che finisce su Instagram senza portare link. Quindi ci sono le infografiche, pensate alle infografiche che fa l'Economist, sono meravigliose nella loro essenzialità, ma quanto più è semplice, quanto più una cosa è complicata prima. Per cui e queste cose con la pandemia si sono notevolmente accelerate. La possibilità di fare una diretta video, la possibilità di eh, fare un'intervista dall'altra parte del mondo attraverso appunto Zoom, piuttosto che questa piattaforma o tutte le altre. Bene, è un grande momento per i giornalisti e per il giornalismo. Poi lasciate perdere il business del giornalismo, le, le, le case editrici, l'editore, che poi invece hanno delle difficoltà per, per ottenere le revenue necessarie per garantire l'indipendenza del giornalismo. Ma per noi giornalisti è, è una grande possibilità. Ed è una grande possibilità per i giovani e per chi esce fresco di studi, perché assieme alla competenza oltre a un po' di mestiere ci aggiunge anche la capacità di sapere quale data la notizia e dato il target di riferimento a chi voglio rivolgermi con questa notizia scoprire quale deve essere il mezzo migliore non sempre un articolo non sempre un video eh, eppure se, cioè, se io voglio rivolgermi a dei ragazzi dai 20 25 anni devo andare su Instagram e ci sono altre regole e se voglio andare su Facebook ci sono altre regole, se voglio usare le notifiche push ci sono altre regole. E quindi è una grandissima occasione perché si riparte tutti da zero e chi ha buon vento secondo me arriverà in fondo. Grazie a tutti. Bella la metafora del buon vento. Senti Marco, so che poi tu avrai una riunione di redazione e dovrai andare via, ma magari riesci a tornare, per cui ti aspettiamo più tardi perché sono sicura che i ragazzi avranno delle domande anche per te. E mi piacerebbe che potessero salutarti anche loro eh, però adesso io passerei all'ospite all d'onore di questo evento che è Margaret Sullivan e quindi passerei a parlare in inglese e spero che eh, chi, chi è collegato che è italiano sappia l'inglese però abbiamo il vantaggio di avere una traduttrice che ci farà la traduzione testuale dentro la chat di Facebook per cui 
eh, chi è collegato e fa fatica a capire Margaret, anche se secondo me la capite perché ha un inglese meraviglioso e parlerà lentamente, però ci sarà anche la traduzione scritta del senso di quello che sta dicendo. Eh, per cui seguite la chat. E nel frattempo vi dico anche che se volete fare domande, anche voi collegati su Facebook e non solo i miei studenti, potete ovviamente prenotarvi mandando dei messaggi dentro la chat e c'è qualcuno dell'Università di Torino che poi mi farà avere le vostre domande, i vostri commenti. So now I'm switching into English, finally, to say hello to Margaret. Thank you Margaret Sullivan, I'm so honored and excited uh, that you're here, that you were able to come and join us for, for, to speak to my students and thank you for accepting the invitation. Uh, you know how I, I admire your work immensely and uh, how I've been inspired by you to become public editor, which is really a difficult task. And uh, I still sometimes wonder how you did it. Anyways, uh, for those of you who don't know her, she's the Washington Post media columnist. She's writing, she writes on press rights, on the digital transformation on media ethics and uh, the business of journalism. She was the first uh, female and longest serving public editor at the New York Times. And that is how I got to know her. She inspired me and continues to inspire me for that role. And she was also the first female executive editor before that of the Buffalo News, uh, where she started her career as a summer intern. So these students should know that you can actually rise through the ranks to the top, as she did. Uh, she's a former member of the Pulitzer Prize Board. She lives in New York City. And uh, she's about to publish her first book, Ghosting the News, Local Journalism and the Crisis of American Democracy. And I saw her tweet with the, the first copies published, so I think she got her first box sent in. We're looking forward to read it, but we're so excited that today she will tell us a little bit about it. It's like an anticipation of what we can, we'll read eventually when we get her book. And after her speech, there's going to be room for Q&A. And Margaret said she doesn't want to speak too long without your questions, so my students will have questions. and. Uh, and, uh, and then maybe questions will come in also from the public. Margaret, your latest column answers to my students on how to be good journalists, uh, neither by being stenographers nor activists, but uh, sorting out um, uh, competing professional and personal feelings about objectivity, impartiality, activism, identity, integrity, social justice. I hope we can get into that a bit also in the Q&A maybe later and after talking about uh, local journalism and, and the crisis of the local journalism. But I also hope we'll have time to comment the latest resignation of James Bennett uh, from the position of opinion editor of the New York Times and uh, Senator uh, Tom Cotton's battle on Twitter. I think that's, I mean, it's it's current events and it's that it's amazing to have you here to talk about it the day after basically. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, I am very honored to be with you, and I thank Anna for this opportunity and the university, and it's wonderful to see all of your faces. I wish that we could be truly in the same room, and you know I love Italy very much, and I've been to Italy many times. Um, I would love to be able to um, leave uh, graduation talk and perhaps go to a wonderful restaurant and have a great meal and some wine, but it is not to be. So we will make the best of it as much as we can. So I would like to speak a little bit about my the subject of my book. Um, if any of you buy it, I think I should warn you that it is um, it is novella length, so it is only, maybe I'm not warning you, maybe I'm promising you this in a happy way. Uh, it is only 105 pages and it is a paperback. So don't get any grand ideas about it being a major heavy volume. It is a small book, but it's my first book and I am very excited about it. And I did receive a shipment yesterday of the actual books, um, you know, the printed, the printed books. So it was exciting. Um, I dedicated it to uh, my two children, Alex and Grace. Um, they are young adults and I dedicated it to journalists everywhere. So that certainly includes all of you. So please know that I was thinking of journalists all over the world with this book. So 
Um, writing it was an interesting adventure because um, the situation kept changing as I was trying to write it. The, the premise of the book, the basic point of it is that all over the world, but particularly in the United States, the local regional journalism that has been such a part of our news system for many decades is really disintegrating. And I'm sure you all know the reasons for this. We've had the change in family structure. We've had the change in the way we receive information. Obviously, the internet is probably the biggest factor here um, and the decline of print advertising. So for many years, you know, as you learned, I was the editor, top editor of a regional newspaper in, in New York State. So uh, once you get outside the New York City area, it is the largest news organization, the Buffalo News. And for many, many years, this was a very rich paper in the sense that we were pulling in a great deal of advertising revenue. And in fact, we were owned up until very recently by a famous person you might have heard of, Warren Buffett. So Warren Buffett is a famous investor, uh, one of the richest people in the world. And uh, when I was at the paper for many years, we were essentially sending $1 million per week, every week to Omaha, Nebraska, to the Berkshire Hathaway company that is his company. So uh, very lucrative. Um, I had a staff of 200 people and we really, we were careful, but honestly, we had a lot of money to play around with. That is just no longer the case and many newspapers in the U.S. have gone out of business altogether. Since 2004, more than 2,000 newspapers have closed their doors completely. And many others have become what I call and others call ghost newspapers. So that is the kind of the explanation for the title of my book, Ghosting the News because what's happened is that the systems that were in place for a long time to produce local journalism have, um, they have fallen away. And the result of that is very bad for journalists, of course, and for young journalists, because there really isn't um, much opportunity or not nearly as much as there used to be, but it's even worse for American citizens, and I would say for citizens all over the all over the world. As a matter of fact, I, uh, I one of my chapters, which looks at the global um, situation, starts off with uh, a, a speech uh, given by Pope Francis, in which, strangely, I never thought he cared about this, but he uh, was talking about the importance of local and regional journalism. So, um, you know, it is something that has that has captivated uh, people's attention outside the journalism realm. Um, of course, I try not to be completely pessimistic in the book. And I try to look and I do look at the positive things that are happening, including the coming of nonprofit newsrooms. Um, for example, in the United States, uh, a very prominent one is the Texas Tribune. So the Texas Tribune, which is in Austin, Texas, is a newsroom that is very large and they do great investigative work. And now they are collaborating with another all digital organization, which you might have heard of called ProPublica. So ProPublica and the Texas Tribune have gotten together and they have, um, you know, used their resources together. So I think collaboration um, and innovation are both extremely important as we as we go forward. 
So, um, but I guess, you know, my main message that I'd like to give to, to all of you, and I do want to give you my heartiest congratulations. It's, it's a wonderful day. And, and so my main message to you is that journalism has never been an easy business to break into, and it's never been an easy um, way to live your life or make your living. It's never been easy. It may actually be a little more difficult now, but that's not really why we go into journalism. If we wanted to do something that would be pretty easy and very lucrative, um, we would not really go to journalism school. <laughs> we would do something else. I'm not sure what that would be. I never really considered doing anything else. And maybe that's true for you as well, that nothing has ever captivated you as much as journalism. And if that's the case, and if you are willing to work hard and to deal with some difficulties, I really have no doubt that you can be successful and that you can make a difference in your society. And that's really, I think, what we want to do. We want to tell the truth so that citizens can hold their government accountable. I mean, that is our core mission, and it's not an easy one, um, but it's a really worthwhile one. So I'm, I'm so glad to see that young people like yourselves are, are doing this work, and it's great. So, um, but you know, there are a lot of juicy, wonderfully interesting things going on right now, as Anna alluded to. So it might be fun and interesting to talk about some of those. Um, and we can certainly talk about what's happened at the New York Times um, and in other big news organizations. Um, so I would love to, you know, broaden our discussion out so we're talking to each other a little bit. Um, so, you know, Anna, would you like to um, maybe um, start our discussion off with one of the points you were making? I mean, I'm happy to talk about my views on objectivity, on whether journalists should be part of the action, um, all of that, and and also happy to talk about what happened at the Times, where I don't work anymore, by the way. Of course, we know you don't work at the Times anymore. You're at the Washington Post, but for some reason, I mean, you seem to be sorely missed by everybody on social media. They keep, they keep calling you out every time there's a problem at the New York Times. They say, what would Margaret Sullivan say if she were the public editor? And would this have happened if she had been at the New York Times? And so you're sorely missed. And uh, that's very interesting and, uh, and also wonderful for you, but maybe not so much for the news organizations that didn't replace you for some reason. Maybe we could start from there. I mean, why isn't there more? Why is public being a public editor not a thing anymore at the New York Times? And I think also at the Washington Post, right? Yes. The Washington Post had a, they called it ombudswoman, ombudsman or ombudswoman for a long time before the New York Times did. But they ended their position um, several years ago before the New York Times ended theirs. And now the Times, which only had one from about 2003 or four until about 2018, you know, so it didn't really last that long. They have ended theirs. National Public Radio still does have one, um, and there are others. But I think it's, um, you know, having a public editor for the top editor of a newspaper, it is never a comfortable thing. You don't want someone looking over your shoulder. And that is what the public editor does. Uh, they look over your shoulder. Someone described it as, having a shadow editor. So um, I think when newspapers and other news organizations started um, having financial difficulties, it was a good, it was thought, you know, it was a convenient time to move past or to get rid of, I guess, the public editor or not to renew it. And also, one thing that we heard a lot was, well, now we have social media, we have Facebook, 
we have Twitter especially. And so when a problem arises, we can rely on social media to bring up these problems and then we can discuss them on Twitter, on social media, we can answer them. This is the news organization's point of view. I would disagree with that for one main reason, which is at least when I was the public editor of the New York Times, it was, it was expected and built in to the job that you would be able to talk to the top people and get good answers. Um, and then you were able to, well, what I tried to do was take people's complaints that I would hear and then take those complaints, well, I would study the problem, take those complaints to the top editors, get their responses, and then I would try to synthesize um, the complaint, the problem, the response, and come to some kind of conclusion. I don't think this can happen on Twitter. Or if it can, I've never seen it happen. Yeah, I mean, I, I try to explain to my students the difference between the real public editor ombudsman position and what I'm doing, because I'm a public editor uh, Italian style. I mean, first of all, I'm the only one in Italy too, but I mean, I don't depend from the publisher. I mean, I report back to the editor in chief. So this makes it a whole different thing. So I try to do, I've really been inspired by what you're doing and I try to do what you did. I mean, what you did in, in the New York, the New York Times, and I've been trying in these past four years to do it also, but it's much, di the difference is incredible when you have to, you know, you have to get along with the editor in chief if you want to be published. He's not going to publish my column if he doesn't agree with it. So I, I have strong discussions. By the way, now my editor in chief just changed, so it makes it I'm starting all over again. But I have had the same one for four years, and we reached agree. I mean, it was a very interesting job, but really, really hard to always pin down something that we both agreed with should be a column every week. And uh, I was wondering if you like how terrible was it for you to be public editor? And I'm sorry I'm bringing you back to the New York Times. I know you're at the Washington Post now. I know you okay. love. I know you love your job as a media editor. I mean, I think that's a much more fun job to talk about the media in general, not about the problems of your own paper. But I mean, I think being a public editor is a terrible job in terms of hardship, in terms of getting hard. Pro I mean, getting you know hard getting shit from both my, my colleagues and from the readers and having to be in the middle, sort of cut in between um, uh, in, in a very hard place. Did you like it? Did you like being a public editor? Well, you know, now I have a few years, uh, I've been gone from that job for four years, so I can look back on it a little more fondly now, but it was, it was very difficult while I was doing it. You're right that you get caught between different groups of people. Um, always there are egos to contend with. Um, but I also found that if I was soft on the New York Times in any way, uh, I would hear back from the readers saying, what good are you? So I had to be tough and uh, and it was difficult, but it also, you know, frankly, was a great opportunity for me because I was able to come from a regional newspaper to New York uh, City and to live in New York City and to be um, a part of the New York, an important part of the New York Times. And I did feel that people appreciated it, that readers appreciated it, and even the people inside the Times, I would often hear from people that they did appreciate what I was doing. So it was, I guess I would have to describe it as a very mixed experience. No kidding. Okay, well, I have questions for you. I have tons of questions, but I think the students have questions too. So I will come back with my questions if they haven't uh, asked them themselves later. And I would like to let them have the floor and maybe they can start asking their questions first. Please Great. go ahead. Ragazzi, tocca a voi. Chi ha voglia di fare domande? Go on for the questions. You get, I turn my microphone off. Good morning. I'm Martina. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to ask you a question about um, local journalism. 
because um, usually in Italy, when we speak about um, local journalism, we we mean, I mean, um, many times um, local journalism means bad journalism in Italy. And uh, my question is, how can a local newspaper be able to keep the community's attention and to sustain itself economically and at the same time avoid uh, um, clickbaiting, uh, voyeurism and uh, fake news? Thank you. Oh, thank you. That's a great question. And it's, uh, well, I guess I would say you could write a book about that. It's very, um, it's very sweeping. I mean, to me, the biggest problem right now is the economic problem because the revenue base has gone away. And that's a huge thing. You know, how are we really going to sustain ourselves? And I think the basic answer to that is that we have to have a closer tie to the communities that we're covering. And the people in those communities must feel that we are um, truly representing them and trying to do important work that they attach um, importance to and a value to, enough of a value that they will pay um, a subscription rate that might be much higher than it used to be because it used to be that advertising would sustain us. Now we have to really look to the people of the community to sustain us and that's much harder. But I think it comes down to doing important good work, especially investigative work. You know, uh, you hear about um, community uh, user-based, uh, user-generated journalism, which is, you know, can have its value. Um, a neighborhood Facebook page or a site that tries to do this work I feel that journalists bring something special to the table that can't be replaced by those things. And that is the, the rigor and the uh, training about being able to dig down under the surface and really find things out about, you know, a but like a, a local budget or a, a bad public official who's um, engaging in something illegal. These are things that only, maybe not only, but for the most part, trained and committed journalists can do. And I think if we do that well enough and we reinvent ourselves for the digital age, we have the best chance of surviving. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Nicola. My question is, uh, what is the ideal business model for local journalists? Mm. Well, yes, I think that's something that is, it's changing as we speak. You know, as, as we said, there was a time when the best business model was to rake in a lot of print advertising dollars. That's no longer the case. At this point, from a business model perspective, it may be that the nonprofit organization that is funded by philanthropy and membership is probably best positioned to pay the bills. <laughs> so, um, you know, I will give the example of um, of one in Buffalo. So in addition to the newspaper, which of course still exists, but it no longer has 200 people in the newsroom. Now it's more like 70, 75. But there is a, a newer organization called Investigative Post. And it's a small investigative nonprofit funded largely by um, donations and grants and some membership and they do great work, but they only have a few reporters. So this is the problem. I think that has the best, the best um, approach to going forward, but it doesn't have the scale right now that we would like to have. 
So it's a tricky, there's no good answer, unfortunately, but that's about the best, I think. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, Margaret. Hi, Mar mm -hmm. Hello, Margaret. I am Luca. Hi, Luca. N nice to see you. Thank you. Um, one question. Uh, do you think that uh, uh, local news suffers from uh, mergers um, in, uh, of uh, news organizations? Uh, why and how so? Thank you. I, I missed a, a key word. Do I think that local journalism suffers from? From mer mergers of uh, news organizations. Mergers and acquisitions. Mergers, mergers. Uh, yes. yes, yes, I sh yes, absolutely. Uh, it does, Luca. It, it, one of the things that's happened is that these large um, private equity companies and um, corporations, well, two different things. One is chain ownership of newspapers is is in general can be a problem. It, there was a time when local newspapers were might be owned by a local family. Well, that has changed. They've, for the most part, been bought up by large chains. In the US, for example, the Gannett Company, which is the same company that, that owns and runs USA Today. So uh, this can be good or bad, but one thing it does is it takes some of the local control out of those newsrooms, um, and that's not a good thing. But I think far worse than that is these hedge funds and private equity companies that have bought up a lot of troubled, financially troubled newspapers. And what they're trying to do is has nothing to do with journalism. It has to do with trying to harvest the last profits from these companies. So they lay a lot of people off. They do anything just to keep the company making a profit and they reap that profit and there's no effort to plan for a future that would continue the journalism. So I do think that the ownership of these organizations is a huge problem and your question is very astute. Thank you. Hi, Margaret. Hi. Hi, nice to meet you. I am Federico. Hi, Federico. Um, uh, I would ask uh, to you, uh, in your research, uh, um, did you find uh, hope uh, for uh, uh, local newspaper, uh, local uh, realities? Uh, um, how can they uh, retain readers? Well, th yes, that is a, that's a big challenge. I think the way they can retain readers is by making themselves necessary, you know? And I would even use the word indispensable so that the readers feel that if they don't have this newspaper in their community, they are really missing something. Um, and without that kind of a strong connection between the readership and the news organization, uh, there is no chance of success. But, but there are some examples in the United States of local regional newspapers that are doing, uh, that are doing quite well with this and that have, and one of the key things is they don't consider themselves just a print newspaper anymore, but they have, really capitalized on the digital um, opportunities and, uh, you know, presenting their journalism in a way that is really uses the tools of the digital world in a, in an, in a good way. And I think still some people want to hold the paper in their hands and they want to feel and see that print and others are, ready and willing to move to digital and some people are in between so we have to kind of build the bridge 
while we're uh, walking on it. And that's not easy. It's not easy. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Margaret. I'm Vincenzo. Nice to see you. Thank you. You too. I would love to ask a question about uh, citizen journalism. How can citizen journalism help local journalism and uh, why it's so underdeveloped? Well, one of the, uh, thank you, that's a great question too. I, um, one of the things I researched in my book was a, um, a community called East Lansing, Michigan. So it's not too far from Detroit, Michigan. Um, and there, this woman uh, who is very smart and has a PhD s started up um, a digital news organization that is completely staffed by citizen journalists. And they, um, I mean, she recruited people who were not journalists, who were maybe retired government workers or housewives or others. And she basically taught them how to go out and cover a meeting and um, how to write about all the things that were not getting covered. And, um, it's gotten a pretty good foothold. It's, uh, you know, they don't make a lot of money and they don't aren't able to pay people much at all. But people understand that this is valuable work. And so they're doing it. And it's a really interesting model. And this woman I interviewed who started it said that everybody wants, everybody in journalism these days wants to focus on revenue as the problem but she thinks that it can be solved in the other direction by getting people who have an interest in their community to do the work for a very small amount of money or maybe no money at all so i think we have to look at a lot of different kinds of solutions here there will not be one perfect answer thank you thank you Hi, Margaret. I'm Valeria. Nice to meet you. Hi, Valeria. Hi. Uh, I have a question uh, about journalism uh, and power. Um, you wrote in a recent article uh, on the Washington Post uh, that the president didn't start this ugly cycle of media bashing, but he's made it uh, immeasurably worse. So, uh, in your opinion, how can the media uh, stop the bashing and improve its condition? Well, I don't think there is much of anything we can do about President Trump attacking the media because it is very much uh, part of his, it's something he's been doing for many years and it's part of his, um, his whole way of being president. It's, it's built in. He actually appeals to his base of voters by um, by going after the media and they like it. They feel like we don't trust these elite journalists and we are happy, President Trump, that you are attacking them on our behalf. So there's not much we can do about it in the, in the immediate sense, but your point was that this goes back before Trump. And there, I think, there is a lot of mistrust um, from, from uh, people, the public, toward journalists. And, you know, the breakdown in local journalism has contributed to that because at one time, you know, you would go to the supermarket or your child's school and you might find there um, a reporter who, you know, you would have that community sort of, oh yes, we know this person because they live amongst us. But now with that whole system so much uh, shrunken so much, now journalists are more concentrated um, in New York City, in Washington, in the big cities. And then I think that, that contributes to this sense that they don't understand us and we don't like them. So 
part of the solution is to is to try to forge greater connections um, between you know the general public and journalists and to show that we can do the kind of work that will that will matter to them and it's not something you can do overnight we but if we're going to be successful we have to we have to work on the trust issue okay thank you thank you hello i'm adriana hi adriana linking to the previous question how should journalists relate to power especially when it is hostile to the press both at the national and the local level well uh there are some people who say that journalists should be in a, a fighting position with power they should be adversarial um i don't necessarily believe we need to be adversaries to power but what we do need to do is be unafraid of power and willing to stand up to power so uh this means this you know okay that sounds great how does it how does it play out in real life well it may mean that you if you cover a beat let's say you cover uh um, city hall, you know, city government. It may mean that the people that you cover are going to be pretty unhappy with you for, because of some of the work you do. And that's probably a good thing um, because if the people we cover on our beats are constantly happy with us, we can be pretty sure we're not doing our jobs correctly. So there is this tension. Maybe it's not truly adversarial, but there has to, there will always be a tension between journalists and power. And we have to know that, and to some extent we have to embrace it, or at least not be afraid of it. And it's hard. I mean, it calls for a lot of courage on our parts. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jacopo. Hi. Trump's first term began with the proposal to build a wall on the Mexican border and is ending with a wall around the White House. <laughs> with this protest, did Trump's position worsen in view of a, a re-election? Well, you, you make a great point that the wall which he said would be built and that Mexico would pay for, um, that hasn't really come to pass, although there's been some effort to build some things at the border. Um, now, because he feels under siege, there is an effort to build this sort of to protect the White House. And it is um, a very strange thing to see the wall go up there. Um, you know, I it's, it's a difficult position um, for a journalist to to, um, you know, I, I guess I will say I write an opinion column, so I'm allowed to express myself in a way that a, a straight news reporter might not. And I will say that I think that particularly from a press rights perspective, Trump has been um, a very bad influence for the United States. He has he has hurt us in that way. Um, as far as the wall goes, I mean, I, I think that what we need in our public officials is someone who can speak to, you know, go out into communities, go out to the country and speak to the pain and the agony that is taking place in communities rather than to sequester yourself um, and stay so protected. Hi, Thank Margaret. You. I'm Chiara. Hello. Nice to meet you. You too. Hello. Um, in the argument between Trump and Twitter, but also between Twitter and Facebook, who do you think is right? Mm. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes. Well, I, 
Facebook is almost always wrong about everything. So they'll start with that. Um, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but um, I do think that these social media platforms need to come to terms and recognize that they are responsible for a great deal of harmful misinformation that's being circulated on their platforms. And to that point, I think Twitter has done a better job than Facebook in saying, um, you know, for example, we aren't going to take political ads um, and saying we are willing to at least make a start toward um, restraining or labeling um, some of the president's um, very inflammatory and inaccurate statements. Now, President Trump pushes back against that and says he's being censored. But I think all of you guys and I know that that's, that's not censorship. I mean, um, if that was censorship, then every bit of editing that took place in a newsroom or every time we say, well, that's not true, so we're not going to print it, that would be censorship too, but it's not. It's just recognizing that there's there's such a thing as truth and we have to try to stick as close to that as we can in as many ways as we can. But, you know, Facebook has been a, a has done a lot wrong and they have um, contributed to um, the spread of very harmful misinformation. So they have a real reckoning to do and they don't seem to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Margaret. I'm Nadia. Nice to meet you. Hi, My Nadia. question. Hi. My question. Colin published yesterday on the Washington Post. You wrote that journalists should avoid being stenographers or politically involved. But what about op-eds? What is the criterion for choosing commentary articles that account for the debate? Are there general principles to be inspired by? So, um, thank you. I, I appreciate your question. Um, you know, there's this whole, there's a lot of turmoil taking place in the United States right now. A lot of it is about, I mean, it's really a confluence of different things. There's the uh, coronavirus epidemic and the economic results of that. And I know that Italy is certainly well familiar with that. And on top of that, we've had this huge period now of racial um, protest because people have seen the police in different cities treating people of color very badly. And the combination of these things has resulted in um, all these protests all over the country. And I think it comes down to uh, inequality. So, you know, as journalists, we want to stand up for the things that we believe in. And certainly for me, one of those things is equality for, um, for people of, of different races, for people of different um, income levels. Um, I believe in gender equality. Um, all of these things. And I think in general, the journalists I know also feel this way. I mean, this is kind of what draws us into journalism. We care about these social problems. So now we're presented with a situation in which there's all these protests and how do we act about it? And the reason I said, don't be a stenographer. So a stenographer would just write everything down and not bring any kind of interpretation or judgment to it. And a lot of people, members of the public say that is what they would like. Just give me the facts. Don't interpret it for me. 
My argument is that every time you present facts in a news story, a video, a, a, even a photograph, you are bringing your interpretation to it. You, every word is part of an interpretation and you have to be aware of that. So that's why I say, don't pretend to be a stenographer because we can't do that. At the same time, I don't think we should be involved in party politics. I think we need to maintain a sense of impartiality. Um, you know, people talk about objectivity and it's become a very um, fraught, a very difficult word. Um, and so I like to frame this conversation a little differently that I think we should be trying to be fair and we should try be uh, trying to present the truth. So, and to be, yes, to bring impartiality to it. So I guess I can't really uh, subscribe or I can't recommend that that people who are journalists be activists, I don't think those things should go together. But I do think we can, through our work, stand up for press rights. I think we can stand up for equality under the law. Um, I think we can stand up for civil rights in general um, without apologizing. Margot. Hi, Margaret. Uh, pleased to meet you. I'm Ricardo. Hi, Ricardo. Um, in uh, your opinion, are social media companies uh, responsible of the content uh, published on their uh, platforms? Or uh, do you think that um, that kind of uh, responsibility should be limited uh, to news uh, organization in general? Thank you. Well, I think that social media companies do have a responsibility. I mean, they can't. OK, let's look at Facebook. Facebook has, I think, now two billion users. So, you know, Facebook, Facebook's administration or their leadership cannot be uh, fact checking everything that you or I say um, to our, you know, friends on Facebook. But I think that when it comes to things like hate speech or inciting violence, or when it comes to um, uh, very influential public officials who are spreading misinformation, then I do think that social media companies have to recognize that they have responsibility and they have to do something about it. I mean, there have been moves in this direction. You know, Facebook has linked up with some um, fact-checking organizations and, you know, Twitter and Facebook both will tell you that they forbid hate speech, but how does it get carried out? Uh, the devil is in the details. Thank you. Hi, Margaret. I'm Francesca. Nice to meet you. Um, my question is, uh, how, ca um, how can a young journalist uh, um, find his or her audience uh, uh, amongst the public? Uh, on which media uh, should he or she focus in particular? Well, I mean, it's a different, it's a different answer for different people. Um, you know, some of us, and I guess I would put myself in this category, we are really writers and we we do best when we're writing um there are others who tell stories better in video or in photographs or on the radio um all of these all of these media have positive qualities i think i've always been a believer in i guess i call it and this is a uh, this is an idiom in, in English, but playing to your own strengths. So, um, you know, for me, playing to my strength is I'm basically a word person. And so, you know, if there was no way to express myself in writing, 
I might not have become a journalist. So I think, you know, however, having said that, I also think we need to be multifaceted. You need to, um, you need to know how to do a lot of things and to do them well. Um, and so, you know, it's great to be able to shoot video. It's great to be able to have some skill with podcasting, um, as well as the traditional ways of, of doing journalism. So I think the more we can develop our diverse talents, it will position, it will position all of you best to take advantage of whatever opportunities are there. And you might have to learn something quickly uh, on the fly, you know, in order to take advantage of an opportunity. I mean, this is a small example, but when I was a summer intern in Buffalo a long time ago, uh, I wanted to get a real job at the end of the summer. And the only job they had was as a business reporter. And I really had no experience as a business reporter, but I, of course, took the job and then I had to learn it. Uh, I was learning on the job and um, and it it was OK, you know, but it it was it was hard. And so I think we always have to be in this mode of being willing to do something that we're not sure we're good at and just. Um, take that chance and then work as hard as we can to kind of catch up. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Margaret. Hi to see you. Hi, you too. Hi. Uh, my question is linked to the previous one. Um, as young journalists, what skills should we focus on and, and improve in your opinion? You, talk, you talked about the podcast, uh, I don't know. Right. Um, I mean, I think that the core skills of journalism are the most important things, and they actually translate into all the different areas. So if you can really be a great reporter and you know how to dig into documents and get at the truth, or you're very good at developing sources, um, those skills of, you know, sourcing, um, research, um, documentation, they cut across all the different categories of journalism and they will serve you well no matter what you're doing. I mean, there's a, just speaking of podcasting, there's a podcast uh, in the US called Into the Dark and um, I, I might be getting some of the details wrong here, but it's it's um, they basically dug they moved these podcasters moved to this community in Mississippi and worked on a case in which a man said he had been wrongfully convicted of murder and um, that man was released. And, you know, it, in some part, it was due to their reporting. Now, these are people you don't think of podcasting as being investigative journalists, but they were. And so I don't think the method or the medium is as important as the skills. And I think those skills, and I know you all have them, um, but you can still work on getting better all the time. And of course, one of the great things about this business that we're all in of journalism is that you do continue learning. I mean, it is a it is a field that um, you have to keep improving, and that's what keeps it interesting. I mean, of course, this is the thing I should say too. I feel that I've been very blessed in a long career in journalism because I have never had a single boring day. And um, how I've had bad days. I've had days I've cried and days I've felt terrible, but I've never had a boring day. And um, I think that's something that's relatively rare. So I value it and I, I hope you find that to be the case too. Hi, Margaret. Uh, nice, to nice to meet you. Where, 
wait, where are you? I want to look at you. I'm Ricardo. Oh, yes. I'm hi. Ricardo. Hi. <laughs> hi. I, uh, my question is, uh, I feel the, the need to find a balance between uh, the long production time of uh, high quality work and uh, the short deadlines that need to be met. What is your advice? Thank you. I mean, you know, it, 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 it's, it's a hard thing to answer in a global way. Um, I do think that we have to remember that if our work is fast, you know, we talk in, in uh, again, to use a, an American journalism idiom, we talk about hot takes. So the hot take is a, um, something comes up and I write 500 words and it's not really worth much, but it might get a lot of clicks because it's very current at the moment. Um, you know, hot take journalism is not is not something we should be striving for. Um, but sometimes it's appropriate to have something that's quick and quick, but still has quality to it. And I think we can do best when we are responsive to what's happening right now, but also are looking at, you know, trying to do both really, trying to do the longer, deeper investigative piece, but not being so buried in it that we can't pick our heads up and do something quick to satisfy an editor, to, you know, keep us in the conversation um, without, without retreating from or forgetting about that larger deeper work that probably has more value to it so i would say it's not either or it's both and you any more questions you guys have you guys have exhausted me. And there's more coming actually from Facebook, but before extending you the, the questions coming from Facebook, I wanted to ask you, I mean, I'm not sure that Ariana Chicone and Chris Potter are, are connected, but they knew you were coming oh. and they might be listening in. Okay. You were, I mean, you were meant to come to the Perugia Journalism Festival this year. Yes. And, uh, I even had my plane tickets purchased. I know. So we are really sad, but we hope you will when the pandemic subsides and the next at the next festival, hopefully. I'm going to and, do a uh, lot of things when the pandemic subsides. <laughs> yeah, I imagine. And and you know, you can enjoy Italy as well. So we'll welcome yes, you I here. Very much so. Yes. But do you think the topics of the panels you were meant to be on? Like, you know, you had many panels. You were gonna be on, on the misinformation panel, a media literacy panel a panel on accountability, transparency, and covering, and covering government lies, do you think they will keep being relevant? And there was one panel that you were going to be on that I think there was a great question. Maybe you can answer already now here, because I'm sure you, you have an opinion about it, is that do you think the struggling journalism media should take money from Google and Facebook to make ends meet since they took all the advertising? Well, um, I do think that Google and Facebook, um, I, I think, of course, we need to make sure that when we take uh, funding <clears throat> from social media that, that there are um, restrictions built in so that we maintain our independence. But at this point, I'm not to you know this industry which is so important is really suffering and so i think we have to look at every possibility and um yes i'm i'm not opposed to accepting funding from social media companies if it's done in the right way okay um, as for the international journalism festival which is just one of the great fun things that you can do in this life um, I was so sorry to see that it was canceled, but of course it had to be. And I'm just hopeful that um, that it goes on next year. And I was definitely signed up to do too many panels. So <laughs> I have to be more careful. I, it's difficult for me to um, 
it's difficult for me to say no when I'm, you know, asked by people I like, like you, Anna. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. So, um, before, I, I mean, there's questions coming from Facebook, but I can't, I mean, we still haven't covered the Bennett story. And I was wondering if there's a piece of news there that we are missing. I mean, when he said he resigned, did he just resign from the position or from the whole New York Times? He resigned from the New York Times um, altogether. So wow. he's not going to work at the Times anymore. And it's, you know, it's big, uh, particularly because James Bennett, who was the opinion editor, was very high ranking at the New York Times. And he was one of um, just about three or four people who were being considered for the very top job, which is now held by Dean Baquet, who's going to retire probably in 2022, or at least come off the masthead. He won't be executive editor anymore. So Bennett, you know, this is really a big deal because Bennett was really a top candidate for that for that position, which is one of the most powerful positions in media in anywhere in the world. So yes, it's it's a big deal. And you know, although it was um, it was related to this op-ed piece that had the headline send in the troops um, to, in other words, send in the American military to, yeah. you know, control what's happening in American cities. Um, you know, I don't think that it's ever just about one thing. And this uh, issue has touched off at the New York Times um, very strong feelings about how staff people, particularly black um, and, and staff people of color, feel like the organization hasn't changed quickly enough, doesn't, uh, isn't responsive enough to their views. And then this comes along and it kind of, uh, the whole thing really exploded. So yeah. it's, uh, it's a little bit broader than one, simply one op-ed piece. Yeah, but uh, it is an incredible thing that happened at the New York Times, and we're watching it from abroad because the New York Times has always been a beacon for us for journalism. We've always looked up to the New York Times, and we still do, even with its corrections. I mean, the whole matter has been transparently reported by the New York Times. I'm not sure if Mario Tedeschini Lali is listening in on Facebook, but he's a journal Italian journalist who retired from La Repubblica. And he's a member of ONA, the Online Newspaper Association, and he he underlined how it's incredible how in Italy it's inconceivable to imagine a department of the newspaper that reports on the op-eds of its own newspaper. I mean, we don't have that. That's is that does, is that only at the New York Times, or is that also at the Washington Post? I mean, the Washington Post has also reported on things that have happened there um, pretty well. So. But, you know, if you got to um, a smaller newspaper, um, particularly one where, you know, maybe the publisher has a very firm hand on the editorial uh, product, you might not see that or it would be very uh, toned down. The Times has shown um, admirable transparency in the way it's covered this. And also another problem that we have a lot in Italy is the, with the headlines. And it seems like it, it kind of consoles me that even the big New York Times has headline problems. I mean, most of the problem with this story was that horrible, terrible headline, send in the troops. Afterwards, they corrected it by putting Tom Cotton uh, said it and in, in the headline. They said Tom Cotton send in the troops in, in quotes. And that's different. But still, that was, it was too late. Right. We, yes. Uh, there was also another terrible headline in an American newspaper the past couple of days that resulted in the top editor stepping down. So this was at the Philadelphia Inquirer. And I'm sure you've all heard of the organization Black Lives Matter. Yeah. So this headline uh, 
was on an article about the damage that had been done to um, to buildings in Philadelphia. And the headline said in very big type, buildings matter too. And so it seemed to equate um, wow. loss of black lives or, you know, black people's dying at the hands of police to, you know, blown out windows. And um, that too has resulted in a major, a, a high profile resignation. So you can see that there are um it's a very it's a it's a, an amazing moment in american journalism because um a lot of things are coming to a head yeah absolutely now before i one one last question of mine before i, I turn to the facebook question is i mean Give give us an insight on American politics. I mean, I know you 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 want to be above above it all, but it all seems so incredible. Do you think? I mean, it's it's touching the whole world, right? Whatever happens there. Do you think Trump is still going to win the elections? <laughs> it's a huge protest, I, and the I, pandemic I, might bring him down. I promised myself. I, I have <laughs> promised myself tw twice now not to make any more predictions because I I ne like many other. American journalists, I never thought that Trump could be elected. Um, I I just couldn't imagine it. And when I went into the, I was relatively new columnist at the Washington Post on election night 2016. And I went into the newsroom in Washington in the late afternoon to write my column and yeah. I had a column half written about how the Hispanic vote and how Hispanic media had helped Hillary Clinton uh, become president. So you can see that I'm maybe not the best person to ask about this, but I will say that President Trump has a very strong base of supporters and that number never seems to change very much. His base will support him almost no matter what happens. And he himself has a famous quote um, that his base supports him so much that he could walk out into Fifth Avenue and shoot someone and they would remain loyal to him. So the question is not, will his base of supporters turn against him? Because I think the answer to that is no. But are there people who are independent voters, kind of in the middle, who maybe voted for President Obama twice and then voted for Trump, will they turn against him now and vote for Joe Biden? That's really what it's going to come down to is these swing, so-called swing voters. They're not anti, they're not as radically anti-Trump as some people, and they're certainly not in the Trump solid base. So what are these people in the middle going to do, particularly in the states where it matters the most that because we have the electoral college, it's not, it's not simply a popular yeah. vote. I mean, Hillary Clinton did win the popular vote um, and still lost the election. So in, in states like Michigan, um, in states like Florida and others, where, how are they going to go? And that's, we don't know the answer to that yet. In, in journalism right now, I think, and in America right now, every week seems like a month. And it's a long time between now and November. So a lot can happen. A lot has happened. Yeah, absolutely. So from Facebook, Sophia Ungerland asks, what was the best and the worst story you lived, you lived through as a journalist? Oh my God. Is that too much to ask? Oh, wow, I, I don't know if I'm really prepared to, to okay. deal with that. Um, I mean, it's <laughs> the best. I mean, I, I guess I, I will give an example of something that happened in Buffalo while I was the editor there. There was a terrible, there was a terrible plane crash um, that it was, it was the horrible crash that killed, I think, 50 people. I mean, the plane just went down in a field and it was, you know, it was people coming from the New York City area to Buffalo. And I knew some of them 
and the community was devastated because of this. And we had a great reporter in Washington, but a Buffalo reporter in Washington, who ended up uncovering a lot of the safety issues that underlay this disastrous thing. And some of those things, after a great deal of reporting, were reformed so they could never happen again. And, you know, so I think in that sense, it's the same story that's both one of the worst tragedies and one of the best outcomes. Um, but I will also say that I was in the newsroom in Buffalo when 9-11 happened. I was a new, I was pretty new at being editor. And, uh, you know, we had to react very quickly. We sent a team to New York City. And of course, it's one of the huge things that happened in American history. So to live through that as the top editor of a paper was pretty significant too. Wow. Yeah. So Jill Gribaudo asks about niche publications like Quartz that are struggling with advertising and subscriptions. And uh, since quality journalism must be paid for, how will media evolve if only the big guys can stay afloat in the next years? Yeah, that's it's it's something that's really troubling. Um, you know, there was a time when we thought that there would be certain news organizations that would, um, because they were digital first, you know, like BuzzFeed, for example, they would, we thought for a while that they would not, they would not be subject to the same problems that newspapers were. But it's turned out that the whole news and media ecosystem has been in free fall. So we've seen places um, that once seemed to be invulnerable go through a lot of layoffs or perhaps close just as newspapers have done. So, um, you know, we're, it's really hard to get a handle on this right now. We're in a period of reinvention and really dealing with the fallout. Um, and, you know, something that happened when I was writing my book was that the book was pretty much written and then the pandemic occurred. And yeah. the same uh, economic um, factors that were causing all the, all of what I was writing about became charged on, you know, it was as if they went on steroids and they became much worse. And I had to kind of try to rewrite parts of the book to reflect the way things were disintegrating even faster, the way it had speeded up. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't think we know the answer to that question right now, although it's a good question. And Anton de Nicolò asks, he's, I think he's a freelance, I gather he's a freelance journalist. He says, how can we be a good, good journalist without money? I need money to make journalism my only job, to study and travel and have, and have protection. And uh, uh, he says, maybe precariousness is uh, connected with bad journalism. I mean, is that because we're not hired, that we're not good enough? Well. I mean, I feel very bad for freelancers right now. It's a really tough, it's a very tough time to be a freelancer. It's always difficult to be a freelancer. You're subject to the whims of some news organization that may or may not want your work, maybe doesn't pay you very well. And now those same outlets are struggling. So it's become really tough for, for freelancers and, um, you know, I mean, I feel like I'm being asked questions that there are no answers to. I, I, I agree that precariousness, you know, is not something that you can, that you would ever seek for good journalism. You want to have the resources to do the work properly and you don't want to feel endangered, but I, I don't, you know, I, I don't have the answer to that right of now. Course. Of course. Um, another question on Anglo-Saxon media. We talk about Anglo-Saxon media is sort of a myth in Italy because you know we it's considered the media of objectivity, and uh, um, so Anglo-Saxon media is still holding a leadership in the global media scene. I mean, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, The Economist. What space is there to build a new outlet with a more diverse background, reflecting the reality of global diversity? 
or is it too long a shot? No, I think there are real opportunities here. In fact, the fact that, you know, uh, a new news organization doesn't have some of the baggage that um, that the old ones have. It doesn't have a big building. It doesn't have trucks. It doesn't have to print things uh, on, you know, paper with ink. It probably is much more nimble and much more able to adjust to what's happening. I mean, I think you have to start off small and you have to have a plan to um, raise money in one way or another, probably not through advertising, but probably through either membership or donations, you know, philanthropy or grants. Um, and then the work has to, has to prove itself. But I do think there are some tremendous opportunities out there. And, and I would not say that it's too long a shot. One last question on local journalism to, to go back to the subject of the beginning. I mean, on local journalism, both the many readers are asking, I mean, how can, um, how can one conduct local investigative research in case there's the money to invest without risking their own security or physical integrity and without risking to financially fail after getting sued? I mean, bigger newspapers face the same risks, but they definitely have more resources to be able to react and resist. And also another person, Silvia Scarroni, is asking, how could journalists gain the trust from the local communities back? Could the system of education play a role in this? Okay, I, I, I feel like I'm, um, I, these problems are so huge. I, I, do you think that we could maybe just pick one question and maybe after that call it a day? Because I, I, I yeah, I mean, okay. I'll try to answer the thing about um, about getting sued and everything. Um, I don't know what the situation is uh, globally, but I know that in the United States there are organizations. Um, for example, it's, there's one called the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, that, and there's another one for students called the Student Press Law yeah. Center, and they provide legal uh, help, legal resources for individuals and news organizations that don't have a legal department and they don't have you know famous lawyers who are willing to and able to go to court for you so i think we have to again with a lot of this these challenges collaboration rather than competition is part of the answer Thank you so much, Margaret. That was wonderful. You, you spent so much time with us uh, and we- I am delighted to be with you. I, I, um, I so wish that it could be in person, but I want to wish all of you great luck. Um, your questions were wonderful and um, I'm sure you all have some fantastic adventures ahead. So be safe and be careful and be brave. And we can't wait to read your book. Ciao. Thank you. See Remember, you next it's year. small. Okay. Bye, guys. Ciao. Bye. Ciao. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. You're welcome. Ragazzi, vi, vi invito a salutare Marco Castelnuovo, visto che è tornato dalla riunione ed ha seguito tutte le domande, perché approfittiamo del fatto che possiamo tornare a parlare in italiano. E, e chiudiamo con lui eh, questo incontro che ormai stiamo arrivando alla fine del tempo abbiamo ancora qualcuno sta facendo grande rumore però attenzione eh, abbiamo ancora dieci minuti se volete fargli una domanda e parlare con lui abbiamo ancora un po' di tempo io ho una domanda in realtà che mi è venuta in mente mentre eh, ci parlava buongiorno io sono Roberta Lancellotti ehm... Prima ci ha detto che siamo molto fortunati ad essere dei giovani giornalisti che entrano nel, nell'universo del giornalismo in questo momento. Le confesso che ci sono giorni in cui non mi sento fortunata, eh, non mi sento così tanto fortunata ad esserlo. Eh, le redazioni, i giornali, ehm, le tv mi sembrano un po' chiusi in generale e mi, se mi sembrano chiusi ancora di più in questo momento. Capisco che mh, ho capito tutto il discorso che forse ehm, c'è cioè di distinguere il, eh, eh, le, le testate, gli editori dall'essere eh, giornalisti e il giornalismo, però volevo chiederle in quanto 
anche direttore, e quali spazi, quali opportunità uh, vede che si siano aperte, che si stiano aprendo um, per noi? Ecco. Eh, allora, è molto semplice. Eh, innanzitutto, voi avete partecipato a un master di giornalismo che vi dà il tesserino e vi dà la possibilità di svolgere alcuni stage quindi un piede dentro le redazioni lo mettete molto differente rispetto al freelance perché una volta che voi entrate nelle redazioni avete la possibilità di mettervi in luce cosa che non è scontato per tutti soprattutto per chi lavora da fuori e dopodiché io appunto come dicevo prima e non è tanto, cioè io lo vedo, no? Non è, non è, è ovvio che se uno mi dice guarda io voglio fare il giornalista e voglio lavorare nella redazione cultura del Corriere della Sera, bene, ritengo che ci siano dei problemi. Se invece uno è aperto, ma lo diceva anche prima Margaret Sullivan, ma diceva c'era un posto nel, nel, nel reparto, nel, nel settore economia e mi sono buttata anche se non sapevo niente. Allora, eh, se invece uno segue, guardate, cioè l'esempio di Frida su Instagram o di Will, sempre su Instagram, piuttosto che le nuove eh, giornali solamente online che stanno nascendo, per non parlare di quello che sta nascendo addirittura sulla carta domani e vedremo cosa sarà. Beh, sono tutte eh, novità che non c'erano fino a due anni fa. Nelle scorsi e nei precedenti cinque anni non ci sono state tutte queste novità come in questi ultimi due anni. Se uno inizia a fare un buon prodotto podcast, faccio per dire, c'è la possibilità che nel giro del prossimo anno, anno e mezzo, una redazione gli compri il podcast piuttosto che assuma lui, piuttosto che Google e, o che ne so, Facebook o Amazon aprono un reparto con dentro i giornalisti come hanno fatto in anche altre parti del mondo. Apple ha assunto dei giornalisti. Tutto quello che succede nel, nel, dentro le grandi aziende, del nuovo racconto che c'è delle società, che non è fare l'ufficio stampa, ma è comunicare un, un settore, e beh, tutto questo è una cosa che due anni fa, tre anni fa non c'era e che invece adesso si sta, non solo sta crescendo sempre di più, ma si sta affermando come un, un settore giornalistico vero e proprio. Quindi tutto eh, eh, dipende da quello che vuoi fare. Se uno mi dice, no, per me il giornalismo è scrivere 40 righe eh, dalla Camera dei Deputati e fare il cronista parlamentare, vi dico, buona fortuna. Se invece uno dice io faccio il giornalista perché sono curioso delle storie del mondo e delle notizie, beh, allora pensate solo che Narcos, la famosa serie tv, è stata scritta da dei giornalisti del Wall Street Journal, che in un anno hanno fatto un'inchiesta un, un sulla droga e sul cartello della droga messicana e americana e come si muoveva nell'arte degli anni 70, dopodiché invece di fare due pagine sul giornale è diventata una delle serie più celebrate nella storia di Netflix e degli ultimi anni. Capito? Mi serve a sapere altro, non, so, non ti ho convinto. No, sì sì, <ride> grazie. Cioè, mi convincerà quando... <ride> quando lavorerò a tempo pieno però fino ad allora mi fido sì però lavorare a tempo pieno eh, non devi essere più non, non deve essere più un altro che ti dà il lavoro a tempo pieno devi essere tu specialmente nei primi anni che ti trovi tante collaborazioni da poter lavorare a tempo pieno e poi vedere quello che cresce difficilmente un giornale adesso assume ma perché fondamentalmente sono eh, strutture che si stanno disarticolando quindi però io vedo che ci sono tante iniziative che, che innanzitutto ti fanno fare il mestiere del giornalista e non solo passare le dita o, o, o le foto che è comunque un mestiere ma non è esattamente quello che uno pensa di fare e poi eh, che Poco a poco, secondo me, le cose stanno, stanno cambiando. Certo, uno deve, 
essere molto strutturato, non, non può più permettersi di essere, di essere cialtrone come magari a un, un certo punto anche la nostra categoria è stata. Secondo lei queste... Sì, del tu. Secondo te queste nuove prospettive, questo discorso che hai fatto, mi sembra che valga molto proprio in generale per il nostro tempo. Pensi che il coronavirus, questa emergenza, abbia cambiato le cose, abbia fatto fare un passo in più oppure no? Certo che ho fatto fare un passo in più ed è per questo che voi siete avvantaggiati, perché voi siete praticamente tutti nativi digitali e quindi non vi fa spavento se uno vi dice... Eh, vi dice facciamo uno stream yard che va su LinkedIn eh, se io dico a un mio collega ma anche di 40 anni eh, facciamo uno stream yard con LinkedIn probabilmente mette mano alla pistola non sa cosa sia mi dice ma come parli cosa è successo eh, e invece per voi è normale no? e allora pensate se in una redazione nei tre mesi di stage Oltre a fare tutto quello che vi viene richiesto, voi sui social, eh, attraverso le dirette video, eccetera, vi rendete indispensabili. E visto che, e guardate, lo sto vedendo io, visto che sempre meno soldi, visto che poi si deve parlare anche di soldi, arriva dalla pubblicità tradizionale della carta e sempre più da forme alternative che non sono la semplice skin sul sito internet, che anche quella se la mangia Google, eccetera, eccetera, ma sono dei progetti digitali che vengono costruiti ad hoc insieme al cliente, con il cliente eccetera. Beh, se uno è in grado di, di mettere in piedi dei progetti del genere, beh, benissimo. Benissimo, cioè diventa indispensabile una redazione. Io sai perché sono stato assunto? Perché nel 2006 io ero precario alla stampa, l'Anna si ricorderà, ed ero precario a, alla stampa. La stampa divenne, dopo una serie di contratti da precario, io ero arrivato dopo la scuola, la stampa diventa full color, quindi la stampa di carta cambia formato e diventa full color, e il mio capo, eh, al quale io devo gran parte della, de, 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 di tutto quello che io sono, che si chiama Gian Piero Paviolo, che adesso purtroppo non c'è più, era totalmente incapace di mettere tutti i colori dei codici, eccetera, eccetera. E io studiai il manuale per il sistema editoriale alla perfezione e gli, face, e, e gli coprivo tutti i buchi, tutti gli errori che lui faceva. Lui lasciava eh, codici, colori sbagliati, eccetera, eccetera, e io passavo e rimettevo a posto il capoletto era giusto, la dida corretta, il colore rosso, il colore grigio, il colore blu, a seconda delle cose che doveva scrivere. Quando poi sono scaduto e mi ha fatto il pazzo per assumermi perché diceva io senza questo non riesco a chiudere il giornale la sera. È, è banale, però oh, è, mi, sono, diciamo, mi sono reso indispensabile, mettiamola così. Ecco, grazie. Marco, questo è un bellissimo aneddoto perché, perché visto che loro si affacciano all'ultimo stage adesso, e io a loro gli ho sempre raccomandato, mi raccomando, rendetevi indispensabili, e non considerate al di sotto della vostra portata qualsiasi, qualsiasi cosa, perché nelle, nelle redazioni dei giornali in questo momento ci bisogna della qualsiasi, di tutto, per cui bisogna rendersi indispensabili. È dura perché molti di loro, tra l'altro, rischiano di fare stage parzialmente in remoto, perché il primo mese, a settembre, non tutte le redazioni riusciranno da, a far entrare stagisti in redazione, quindi è uno stage ancora più difficile questo rispetto agli anni scorsi però sono certa che loro sono pronti perché li abbiamo preparati quindi confido nella loro forza di volontà e nella resistenza e flessibilità, capacità di adattamento io direi che chiudiamo qui se non avete altre domande perché il tempo sta per scadere e se no giustamente la pagina Facebook di Unito la, la stiamo prendendo in ostaggio oltre il nostro tempo prefissato io ringrazio tutti quelli che sono, hanno partecipato su Facebook. Thank you also for the English speaking people who participated. E grazie a voi. Grazie ragazzi, noi ci vediamo domani mattina in riunione di redazione, come al solito qua su questa piattaforma. Marco, sei stato un grande. Marco, Castel Marco Castelnuovo è anche un amico, oltre che essere un ex collega, un ex direttore al Corriere, quindi sono molto contenta che abbia trovato il tempo per stare con noi. E, e niente, grazie. Ciao, ciao a tutti. Sì.
Grazie. Ciao. Christopher, ciao. 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 Grazie. Grazie in assenza. Grazie. Ciao, ciao a tutti. Eh. Ciao. Grazie. Ciao. Grazie.